Good morning. Welcome to another online worship service of Grace Gospel Church. I hope you and your family had a good Chinese New Year's celebration. Today is also Valentine's Day. I'd like to greet each and every one of you a happy Valentine's. Don't worry whether your status is single or taken. The most important thing to remember is that God loves us very much. In fact, He loves us so much that He gave His only Son to die for our sins. God's love is sacrificial and unconditional. Remember also that nothing can take us away from the love of God. For this morning service, we will start with a praise and worship to be led by our brother Wayne Wang. Then, Pastor Anita Uy will share a testimony. Then, our Pastor Nathaniel C. will lead us in pastoral prayer. Afterwards, we'll read scriptures from Ephesians 6, verses 18 to 20. Then, our senior pastor, Reverend Alexander Uy, will deliver a message entitled, Praying at All Times. So let us quiet down our hearts and minds and prepare ourselves for worship.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Gospel Church. And I'd just like to greet everyone a happy Valentine's Day in this special day of February 14. And also, I'd like to greet my wife a happy Valentine's Day. Okay. Um, before we start, I'd like to read the passage taken from 1 John chapter 3. Okay. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. It says, See how much the Father has loved us. His love is so great that we are called God's children. And so, in fact, we are. It's so amazing that, um, that we often tend to neglect that we are part of God's family when, in fact, we are um, adopted to His family because of His great love. And um, I hope that we are also very appreciative of that privilege that we have once we were adopted to the family of God. Because I'm sure every one of us know that as, as part of children or from our parents, we are, we, are, um, be, we are able to enjoy the many privileges that we have from our parents. It's the same thing when we are adopted to God's family. We, are, we have all the privilege and all the access to our Father. So I hope that we would be thankful for, to our God the Father and this morning, as we start having singing songs of praise, um, I hope that we could really sing it from our heart to show our love to our Father. Father, Lord, we just like to say thank you, Lord, for your great love. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be part of your family through your son, Jesus. 
Lord, we know, Lord, that it's only through your love, through your mercy, and through your grace, Lord, that we are given this privilege to be part of your family. Lord, we pray that as we live our life, Lord, it will be a reflection, Lord, of how much we love you, that we could live our life, Lord, as a glory to your name. Lord, help us, Lord, that, um, that each and every one of us would be living, Lord, living out the name of a Christian, Lord, that we would be able to live, Lord, as ambassadors, Lord, to, this, to the people, to the lost, Lord. Lord, we pray that as we continue singing songs, Lord, of worship this morning, we pray that it would be glorifying to your name. We pray that it would be pleasing to your ears. All these things we pray in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. an endless song echoes in my soul I hear the music ring and though the storms may come I am holding on unto the rock I cling and how can I keep from seeing Hold me as 
my father and mold me as my you how many times will you pick me up when I keep on letting you down each time I will fall short of your glory how far will forgiveness abound then you answered my child I love you and as long as you're seeking my You'll walk in the power of my daily sufficient grace. At times I may grow weak and feel a bit discouraged, knowing that someone somewhere do a better job for who am I to serve you I know I don't deserve you and that's the part that burns in my heart and keeps me hanging on I ask you how many times will you pick me short of your glory how far will forgiveness abound then you answered my child I love you and as long as you're seeking my face you'll walk in the power of my daily sufficient grace As I walk with you, I'm learning what your grace really means. The price that I could never pay was paid at Calvary. Instead of trying to repay you, I'm learning to simply giving up my life to you for all that you've given to me I ask you how many times will you pick me up when I keep on letting you down each time I will fall short of your glory how far will forgiveness abound then you answer child I love you and as long as you're seeking my face you'll walk in the power of my daily sufficient grace Twenty-six days ago, I was in a hospital. My eldest son tested positive to dengue and was confined. For five days, he had high fever ranging from 39 to 40, severe headache, vomiting, and skin redness. When his fever subsided, his platelets went down. Rash and itchy skin appeared. Abdominal pain and nausea persisted. When the platelets started to rise, we thought we could be discharged from the hospital, but this but his platelets fluctuated, so we stayed two more days and waited until it became stable. On the tenth day, praise God, finally he was declared out of danger and we were finally discharged from the hospital. This was my second battle with dengue. My first battle was more difficult and frightening. Ten years ago, 
My second son had dengue too, but his case was more serious as it developed to dengue hemorrhagic fever. His platelets kept dropping even while he was still having fever. From 105 to 56 to 34 to 29 to 11 to 4. Imagine his platelets were already 4 when the doctor told me that he was just about to undergo the most critical stage. She also told me to be prepared because anything might happen anytime. It was the longest 24 hours of my life. I wasn't able to sleep the whole night because his vital signs were being checked every 30 minutes. Oh yes, two nights before this happened, he vomited somewhat black in color to which the doctors decided to let him undergo blood transfusion. First, eight packs were transfused. Another five packs followed. By God's mercy and grace, God answered our prayers. My son survived the most critical 24 hours. His vital signs were okay, despite his very low platelet. Few more days, his platelets went up and his condition improved. We were discharged after more than two weeks stay in the hospital. Praise God, he is our Jehovah Rapha, our great healer. After going through these two ordeals, I have learned the lesson of waiting. In dengue, I need to wait five days or more for the fever to subside. Few more days for the platelets to rise again and be stable and few more days to be fully recovered. There is no shortcut. I cannot fast forward everything to hasten the journey. I can only wait and go through the journey. But thank God, in waiting, God is with me. I can pray and pour my heart out to Him. His grace is sufficient. His presence, His love, His comfort filled my heart. Moment by moment. Grace upon grace, through prayer, I was able to go through the longest 24 hours of my life, the time when my son had to go through the most critical stage with calmness, committing everything in the hands of our Creator. I thank God for allowing me to go through the journey of waiting, of praying. I've learned what faith is all about, how to trust Him with my own limited wisdom and resources. I've learned how to cling to Him and surrender everything to Him, knowing God is sovereign. His will is always perfect. His plan is always wonderful. He loves us and wants the best for us. Philippians 4, 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart's and your minds in Christ Jesus. Isn't this a beautiful truth? Shall we start praying to know and experience Him more? Church, let's all come to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, You are our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? You are the stronghold of our lives. Whom shall we be afraid of? You are our strength. In You our hearts trust, and we are helped. Our hearts exult, and with our songs we give thanks to you. Your voice, O Lord, is powerful. Your voice is full of majesty. May you, O Lord, bless your people with peace. May we live a life of repentance and thanksgiving towards you always. Father, we just want to lift up to your petitions. We pray for Quezon City, of which it targets herd immunity from the COVID-19 virus in six to eight months after the vaccination rollout. May you be able to grant the local government units their wisdom in order to fulfill this objective. We also want to lift up due to tensions in the disputed region of the South China Sea and the West Philippine Sea, where a, a U.S. carrier was recently deployed there, even as China has already warned the U.S. not to do so. The U.S. is also warning of China's expansionism in East and Southeast Asia while expressing support for Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. Father, we pray for a peaceful resolution in the said region with all the nations involved. We also want to lift up to you your church, specifically the persecuted churches, namely one Myanmar Christians, 
We pray that even though the Christians there were abused under pro-democracy leaders of the previous government, somehow it may grow worse under the present military junta. We lift up to you the 4,000 Christians who were displaced by the junta fleeing in the jungles. May they be able to understand that such a persecution is expected because in Philippians 29, Paul mentions where it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. And Jesus himself mentioned in Matthew 10 that one will suffer and be hated by all for his name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. We pray for the Chinese Christians in China. Uh, Christian employees there are being interrogated and persecuted, being stripped off of benefits, retirement savings, and even reducing their salaries to a fraction, with, which leads to an unsustainable future. Churches there are being raided, and members somehow became fluid in holding fellowships by uh, holding them from one venue to another. The sizes of church populations there were downsized to avoid suspicion, but they do these things in order for the Great Commission to continue and the gospel to be preached unceasingly. It's written in Matthew 10, um, and Jesus said that when they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly, I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. So what has happened before is happening also today. We also pray for the sustainability of the faith of persecuted believers. May they be able to appreciate the blessing of fellowship amidst uncertainty and persecution. It's because it's written in Matthew 5, Rejoice and be glad, for their reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before them. Lord, we just want to lift up to you Grace Gospel Church. We pray for um, spiritual warfare, which happens uh, prevalently. We pray, O oh Lord, that all of us will be aware and be alert on this and would always put on the whole armor, your armor, that we may be able to stand against the schemes of the deceiver because we know that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against cosmic powers of this present darkness. We pray also that the Spirit would be able to enable us to love one another. You send the scriptures that just as you have loved us, so we should love one another. Because by this, all people will know that we are your disciples if we truly love one another. We pray also that you might be able to help us through the Spirit to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us. Because if we learn to love our enemies, then we will be able to love those who are hard to convey our love towards. Lastly, Lord, we just want to pray for our missionaries. We pray for Thara and Bublichan, who are your designated church planters in India. We pray for their uh, planted church in Indri village, that you might be able to sustain them, providing them with all the resources they need, and that I just pray that their faith would continue to be firm amidst the possibility of persecution. We also want to pray for the new members that um, somehow you have given them for them to tend as, uh, their, as, as shepherds. We pray that they would entrust their lives to you again amidst hardship and persecution. And we pray, O oh Lord, for the new ministry that you've given them, this new church, this new potential church plant, may you be able to give them wisdom to, in order again to fulfill the objective of a new church there. Lord, it says in the scriptures that it's neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. So Father, these are our prayers. We pray that you'll hear them and you'll be able to answer them in your appropriate time. May we take confidence in you always. Thank you, O Lord. We just want to lift up to you all these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 
we all pray, Amen and Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 to 20. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Operation Desert Storm was a war that was waged by a coalition of 35 nations from August 1990 to February of 1991. It was a war waged against Iraq when the latter invaded Kuwait. The actual fighting took place from the middle of January of 1991 up to the end of February or a month and a half. The war was a showcase of advanced weaponry by the coalition, which was led by the United States. Now, what was the most effective means that was used to incapacitate Iraq and its ability to fight? It was air support. The coalition deployed more than 2,000 planes and used advanced technology such as GPS to determine enemy targets, to drop smart bombs that were guided to their targets, as well as to launch missiles that fly low and undetected. The aerial bombing started on January 16, and it was only on February 24 that finally the ground offensive took place. So most of the war was waged using air assets as well as uh, missiles, bombs that were dropped from the air. By February 28, a ceasefire was declared. Now, if the coalition had started with a ground offensive and with little or no aerial warfare, the war could have lasted longer. There would have been great casualty count on the part of the coalition. But because the coalition had started with aerial bombardment, they only suffered a casualty count of around 190 soldiers. Iraq, on the other hand, had up to 200,000 soldiers killed. We know that the Christian life is not a walk in the park. It is not peacetime. Yes, we are at peace with God, but we are not at peace with the enemy of our soul, the devil. We are actually engaged in warfare. We are fighting not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual powers and forces that are invisible, but nevertheless powerful. Now, there is an effective weapon that every follower of Jesus Christ can avail of. And in fact, we are commanded to use it. But sadly, it is oft neglected. It is a weapon that enables us to stand firmly against the attacks of the enemy. And that weapon is called prayer. Prayer can be likened to an aerial bombardment that is called in when we are under attack or when we are about to face the enemy. As we continue our study series on being fervent in prayer, we will be looking at a familiar passage that we sometimes don't pay much attention to, or in light of the bigger context, we treat it as if it were a side note. We are familiar with what precedes today's passage, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 17, the passage that talks about the armor of God. But we are not sure where prayer stands in relation to the armor of God. And so let's dive into our study and pick up important as well as practical lessons regarding prayer. As mentioned, the passage that preceded today's text is all about spiritual warfare and the armor that we are commanded to put on. In Ephesians 6, 10 to 17, we learn that we need to put on the whole armor of God 
so that we will be able to stand against the schemes of the evil one. The full armor of God will enable us to withstand the assault of the devil. And not only that, after withstanding the assault, it will enable us to stand firm. The six pieces of armor mentioned by Paul are the following. There is the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Of the six pieces of spiritual armor mentioned, many think that the only weapon in the list is the sword of the spirit. However, we find in today's passage a weapon that is just as powerful. I think many don't consider this last item as a weapon in part because back then there was no parallel piece of armor from the soldier's full armor to compare this weapon with. There was also no weapon in the arsenal of the Roman army that could compare with prayer. Now, there were many weapons available back then for the Roman soldier to use, aside from the sword. Some soldiers carried spears, others used the bow. Then, the army itself would have massive weapons such as the catapult, which were used to destroy walls and fortifications. Some would use what we call as battering rams, and others would build siege ramps, high towers, that would keep on going higher and higher in order that they would be on equal ground with a fortified city. However, Paul doesn't compare any of these to the last weapon that we are looking at, simply because none of them could match up. However, if Paul were writing the book of Ephesians today, he would have a good illustration, and that is air support. Just imagine a platoon of soldiers. They are in the thick of battle. The enemy is hindering them from advancing forward. In fact, they have been pinned down. And so what the commander does is he takes the radio and he makes a call. He asks for air support. And he gives the exact coordinates as to where to drop the bombs. And in a few minutes, bombs begin to fall on the, the coordinates, killing many of the enemies and driving a lot of them to retreat. Now, this would still not be part of the battle gear of the soldier. But the point is, prayer is a powerful weapon. And it is very important for spiritual warfare, just as air support is needed for the ground troops to advance and be victorious. We need to understand that prayer is not just casual conversation with our Heavenly Father. Prayer is also a call for air support, a call for help to come from God. It is an acknowledgement that we need the grace of God to help us to be victorious over temptations, to be able to overcome trials. And so from this text, we find five important keys as to how to use prayer as a weapon. And so for the rest of our time, we want to examine these five keys. The first key that Paul mentions is pray always. Paul tells us, pray at all times. Now here he's not saying that we forget to do other things like work for a living or to study, to do our household chores. He's not saying that. He's not saying that we should be spending all of our time on our knees praying 24-7. Rather, Paul is telling us to pray at every opportunity, that we should maintain an attitude of prayer, of being in conscious and constant communication with God throughout the regular course of our day. We are to pray at every opportunity possible. It should be a top priority in our lives. 
when we are tempted to sin, we need to bring the matter to God to ask Him to help us, to protect us. Whenever we have received blessings from Him, we need to stop and give thanks to God for it. Whenever we see the beauty of God's creation, we need to lift up a prayer of worship. Whenever we are seated behind our office desk, we should ask the Lord for wisdom in what we are doing. When we are dealing with difficult people, we need to ask the Lord for patience and understanding as well as how to treat the other person with grace. Whenever we meet someone who does not yet know Christ, we need to lift them up to the throne of God, asking the Lord to save them and to give them new life. Whenever someone asks us to pray for them, we need to take the opportunity to immediately pray with them and not just simply say, okay, I will pray for you. We need to stop and say, okay, let's pray at this very moment. Praying at all times does not entail going into the physical posture of prayer all the time. In fact, I believe many of our prayers are done silently with people actually unaware of what we are doing. You know, when Nehemiah stood before King Artaxerxes and he was asked what he wanted to do in relation to the state of Jerusalem, we read that Nehemiah prayed to God and then he gave an answer to the king. I believe Nehemiah here simply prayed in his heart to the Lord without going to the fiscal posture of prayer. And most likely he prayed a short prayer because he had to give an answer to the king quickly. And so that's the first aspect of praying as a weapon of spiritual warfare. We should be praying at all times. And so pray at all times. Secondly, we need to pray with all types of prayer. Paul instructed the believers, pray with all kinds of prayers and supplication. Prayer here refers to prayer in general. So this would include worship or adoration of God, the confession of our sins, as well as thanksgiving. Supplication refers to making a petition before God for a specific benefit or a specific need. And so when Paul used these two words, prayer and supplication, together, it covers all forms, all kinds of prayer. And we can learn more about the different forms of prayer in our video series uh, of Chip Ingram that is available for us to use without charge. However, I want us to take note that we are to pray with all kinds of prayer and supplication. You see, whenever we pray, we tend to limit ourselves to supplication. And usually when we are asking from the Lord, we're asking simply for our own sake and for our own benefit. But victory in spiritual warfare is more than just asking God to protect us or to provide us with what we need. Spiritual warfare and victory happens when we worship God, when we give thanks to God, when we confess our sins to God. You see, worship is a declaration of the sovereignty of the uh, might of God. Thanksgiving is the acknowledgement that He is the true source of all blessings. Confession is proclaiming that, God, you are right and I am wrong. Supplication is to say, Lord, I need you. I need you to provide for me. And so all of these forms of prayer must point back to our need for God in our lives. And when we constantly acknowledge our need for God through praying different kinds of prayers, we will be given the power and wisdom needed to stand firm against the enemy. As Paul was addressing the entire church regarding the need for prayer, no doubt the call to prayer includes praying individually as well as praying corporately. 
As believers, we need to spend time each day to pray on our own as well as to pray with the body of Christ. William Cowper, an 18th century English poet, he wrote these lines in a hymn entitled, What Various Hindrances We Meet. These words still apply and should challenge all of us to keep praying. He wrote, Restraining prayer, we cease to fight. Prayer makes the Christian's armor bright, and Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. Brothers and sisters, remember to pray with all kinds of prayers and supplications, keeping in mind our utter dependence, our utter need for God. Thirdly, Paul tells us that we should pray in the Spirit. When we pray, we must pray in the Spirit. And what does that mean, to pray in the Spirit? Now, our charismatic and Pentecostal brethren, they interpret this verse to mean that we should all be praying in tongues. But I don't think that is the meaning here. Others think that it means we should be emotional while we pray. There's nothing wrong to pray with emotion, but we need to be cautious about this because emotionalism in prayer may or may not come from the Holy Spirit. So what exactly are we talking about when we say pray in the Spirit? We need to look at verse 17 to give us the context. In verse 17, we are told, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This would then mean that if we are going to pray in the Spirit, we should be praying based on Scripture, or our prayers need to be grounded on Scripture. You see, the Word of God contains God's will for our lives. In 1 Thessalonians 4.3, that's what it says. And the Holy Spirit will never lead us to pray contrary to the will of God as revealed in Scripture. Don't pray for God to bless your business when you are not committed to following God's way in doing business. Don't pray for the Lord to allow you to marry a non-believer because he already made it clear we, should be, we shouldn't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. We can use the scriptures in our prayers. You know, many people have turned to the Psalms as their prayer book. Many have also turned what they've read from the Bible into a personal prayer. Now, aside from praying, using, and in accordance to the scripture, Praying in the Spirit also means praying under the direction of the Spirit. Have you ever experienced being prompted by the Holy Spirit to pray for someone or something with intensity? I once read this story about a missionary pilot. As he was flying his plane, he was facing a rough storm and he was not sure if he could land his plane safely. But the Lord protected him, and he was able to land his plane without getting hurt, without the plane being damaged. Later, as he was back in the States and he visited the church, he testified to the church about this particular incident of how the Lord protected him. After the service, there was this woman who asked this pilot when and at what time this happened. And when the missionary told this woman the exact time and date, she then told the missionary that on that very moment in U.S. time, she had been prompted by the Holy Spirit to pray for him, although she did not know what was going on. She did not know what was the situation. But the Lord had prompted him or prompted her to pray for this pilot. And so this prompting, is possible for anyone. The Lord could impress upon our hearts 
to pray for a particular person or for a particular situation. This is possible because when we are in a right relationship with God, we become sensitive to His voice. When we are praying consistently, even if you know it is part of our schedule, it is part of our routine, but when we are praying consistently, the Lord can also speak to us when we take time to quiet down and allow Him to say what He needs to say to us. And so remember to pray in the Spirit, using the Word of God, and to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's prompting as to who and what we should be praying for. The fourth thing Paul tells us about praying is that we must persevere in prayer. In the latter part of verse 18, he wrote, Keep alert with all perseverance, meaning keep on praying. We need to be persistent. But why are, to, why are we to keep on praying? Is it because God needs to be pestered to answer our prayers? And when He does so, He does so even with reluctance? Is that what it means when we say we need to pray with persistence? We need to understand this command in light of the overall context of spiritual warfare. A good passage to look into would be Daniel chapter 10. Daniel prayed and fasted for three weeks, asking the Lord to give him understanding regarding a vision that he had received from the Lord. It was at the end of the three weeks of prayer and fasting that an angel finally appeared to him in a vision, coming in order to explain what the Lord had first of all given to him uh, three weeks before. And the angel began by telling Daniel that his prayer had been answered on the very first day when he had asked for wisdom to understand the vision. But then the angel goes on to say that he had been hindered by the work of the demonic forces. He could not get through to Daniel for three weeks. But Daniel was persistent in prayer and the breakthrough happened. Persevering in prayer is necessary in some cases because we need to remember we are all engaged in spiritual warfare. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught his disciples. He said that they were to ask, to seek, and to knock. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 11. Now these words in the original language are all in the present imperative tense. So it carries the idea of not just asking once, seeking once, or knocking once. It carries the idea of keep on, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. The context of this passage is the call for his followers to ask the Lord to enable them to live and embody the values of the kingdom. And you know, to embody the values of the kingdom, that is an important aspect of spiritual warfare. That's why the Lord was telling them, okay, you want to be serious as my disciples, to embody the values of my kingdom, then you need to persist in asking, in seeking, and in knocking. One aspect of spiritual warfare that calls for persistent prayer is when we pray for the salvation of a person. I'm sure that we have heard this story about George Mueller, how he prayed for the salvation of five individuals. In November of 1844, he began praying for these five individuals every day. Eighteen months passed and the first individual became a believer. And so he kept on praying for the four others. Five more years passed before the second person was converted. The third person was converted six years later. The fourth person came to Christ some 25 years after he had started praying. The last person, the fifth, 
became a believer only after Mueller had died at the age of 92. Mueller began praying for these five friends at the age of 40. This meant that he prayed for 52 years for these individuals to come to know Christ. Now that is persevering in prayer. When we pray, especially when we are praying for spiritual breakthroughs, when we are praying for a person's salvation, we need to pray persistently. We need to pray with perseverance. And so we need to ask ourselves the question, will the Lord find us doing so? Will he find us persistent in prayer? Or will we just simply give up after some time? Simply because we don't see the fruit immediately. Finally, Paul tells the believers in Ephesus that they should pray for all the saints. Here, the word supplication is repeated again. And it highlights the importance of remembering our fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord in our prayers. Why do we need to pray for the saints? It is because prayer is an act of encouragement. It is a declaration of our fellowship with them. If one member is struggling with sin, praying for them tells them that they are not alone in the fight. If we pray for a fellow believer who wants to share the gospel with his colleagues in the office, we are partnering with them in God's work. We are also encouraging them to keep on doing the good work when we are praying for them. Now, part of Praying for the saints include praying for those in the front line of ministry. In verse 19, Paul asked the believers to pray for him, that he would be bold in proclaiming the gospel. And so we need to intercede for our pastors, missionaries, and church leaders because they need the boldness to proclaim the gospel. They also need the grace to endure and stand firm for the Lord. We need to pray for ministries such as parachurch organizations that are involved in bringing the gospel to the lost, as well as for advocacies that desire for God's righteousness to be seen in the different arenas of life. We need to pray for believers we may not even know personally, especially for those who are undergoing great persecution. We should also remember to pray for ourselves not just for the Lord to bless us, but more importantly, for the Lord to use us greatly. Just as Paul asked the believers to pray for boldness to proclaim the gospel, we should ask the Lord for the same thing. When I'm praying for this to happen in my life, and when you are praying for the same thing for me, then we can expect nothing less than God working mightily in and through us. So in closing, I want us to simply remember, call air support. As you and I, as we engage in spiritual warfare each day, remember, we must pray. Pray always. Pray with all kinds of prayer. Pray in the Spirit. Pray persistently or pray with perseverance. And pray for all the saints. We need to engage in prayer each day, praying not only for ourselves, but also for others, that we may be able to stand firm against the enemy of our soul and to be victorious for the Lord. And ultimately, it will be all for His glory. Let's pray. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you for your word, which calls us to pray at all times, to pray with all kinds of prayers, to be persistent, to pray for the saints, and for us to pray in the Spirit. Lord, we know that 
too often we have neglected using this weapon that you have given to us. Forgive us for those times when we have neglected that and instead chose to depend on ourselves. We ask, Lord, right now that you will make each of us prayerful men and women, acknowledging our need of you, acknowledging, Lord, that apart from you, we can do nothing. And so, Lord, may we avail and use this weapon, the weapon of prayer, regularly, liberally, generously, Lord. And Lord, we ask that you will continue to, through prayer, grant us victory in our everyday life, enabling us to live in obedience. And more important, it will result in your name being glorified. We give thanks to you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us now receive God's blessing. May God, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. And now to him who is able to keep us from falling 
and to make a stand in his presence, faultless and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority, both now and forevermore. Amen and Amen.